Thank you for coming tonight to this discussion of the widespread and horrendous problem of human trafficking. I'm Ed Larman, Director of Geneva Campus Ministry. We're a UI student organization that seeks to serve Jesus Christ on campus through, through I don't dare, through warm hospitality, intellectual engagement, and practical service. There's more information about Geneva at the table in the back. And before I forget, please turn off your cell phones and other things that go buzz in the night, and we'll try to control the mic from our end. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to introduce the latest winner of the Jason Chen Faith and Learning Scholarship. Jason was the first Geneva campus minister and served here for many years. In his honor, when he retired, the board of Geneva Campus Ministry established this scholarship for an incoming undergraduate student who demonstrates dedication to Jesus Christ and the historic Christian faith, commitment to academic excellence, vision for integrating his or her faith and academic endeavors. I'd like to present this year's winner, Alexis Wallenberg from Inwood, Iowa. Lexi is a biology major and is planning to become an optometrist. So congratulations, Lexi. Thank you. Bless you. Since 1976, Geneva Campus Ministry, assisted by our Ecumenical Geneva Lecture Committee, has brought over 70 Christian scholars, artists, and leaders in a wide variety of fields to speak on campus. When you came in, you were given, hopefully you were given, a questionnaire. Uh, we'd like a little bit of feedback from you before you leave. And if you would like to be informed about our future lecturers, about our monthly forum speakers, or other programs, please uh, check that off. Print carefully your name and email address and uh, leave it with an usher. This time for this lecture, we're doing something new. We have partnered with other campus ministries, Campus Christian Fellowship, Campus Crusade for Christ, the Christian Legal Society, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and Ivy Graduate Christian Fellowship, Parkview Church 24-7 and Reformed University Fellowship. We've had a week-long campaign called Jesus, Justice, and Poverty. Stop the traffic. I want to mention the two remaining events that we have this week. Tomorrow evening at 8 p.m. at the Sheraton Hotel, a one-hour event called Why Jesus, Why Justice? An hour of worship, music, and message. Friday at noon in the Kirkwood Room here at the Memorial Union, will be a time of prayer for justice. Also, there's an ongoing art exhibit at the Fairgrounds Coffee House, and the art for sale is for sale, and 25% of the proceeds will be donated to the uh, International Justice Mission. Last but not least, also I hope that you were given a response sheet that talks about opportunities for you to follow up, different activities that you can be involved in so that you can further your learning, your prayer, and your action. And one of the things that we are hoping is that a chapter of International Justice Mission will emerge from this week and this event. So please note that, and if you're interested in any of those activities, please uh, contact the persons involved. I'd also like to thank the co-sponsors. The events of this week were funded uh, by, in part by a nice grant from UI student government. Also, our lecture is assisted by various individuals, by First Baptist Church, First Presbyterian Church, Newman Catholic Student Center, St. Mary Catholic Church, and the Wesley Center. I want to thank the Geneva Lecture Committee, the ushers from InterVarsity, and especially my new uh, staffer, Catherine Domish, who did all the work, and I get to stand up front. So uh, that's uh, a good deal for me. 
Tonight, uh, our speaker will make a presentation, and there'll be plenty of time for questions and answers with, uh, with microphones. So, uh, looking forward to that. And now, at last, I can introduce our speaker, John Richmond, not to be confused with the John Richmond, who's a fashion designer, but uh, John Richmond was raised in Yorktown, Virginia, earned a bachelor's degree from the University of Mary Washington, and is Juris Doctor from Wake Forest University. He, um, after law school, he practiced employment law, commercial litigation, adoption law, made enough money to pay off his debts, and then uh, followed uh, his heart and his call and joined International Justice Mission that you'll hear more about. He served in two, from 2002 to 2006 as uh, the director of the work in the region of Chennai, um, formerly Madras, India. There he developed a sustainable model for investigating and prosecuting human trafficking crimes and designed a rehabilitation program to care for trafficking victims. IJM teamed with the Indian government officials and during his time rescued over 1,300 slaves in that region. John uh, then uh, became, uh, went to the Department of Justice and he was involved in the transition to the new administration following the 2008 presidential election. He now serves as a federal prosecutor with the Human Trafficking Unit of the U.S. Department of Justice. He has investigated and prosecuted numerous victim-centered labor and sex trafficking cases. His wife and two children, ages eight and six, were especially thankful to John. He probably wouldn't want me to say this, but he took a couple of his personal vacation days just so that he could fly all the way from Washington, D.C. to, uh, to be here. So, we are very grateful to have John Cotton Richmond with us tonight. John? Make sure my microphone here is working. I once had a professor who used one of these uh, wireless microphones. He walked out of class to answer the call of nature and left it on. <laughs> The whole class listened and uh, were surprised that he whistled. <laughs> it is um, it's great to be here with you all tonight. I am um, I'm tremendously grateful to have the opportunity to be at the University of Iowa, particularly to talk about something that is, um, I think, significant and important in our, in our time. But at the outset, I, noting that it's Veterans Day, if there are people here who have served in the uniform of our country. I will be presumptuous enough on behalf of everyone just to wish you a happy Veterans Day. Um, for just over three years, I worked in India with the International Justice Mission Combating Human Trafficking. International Justice Mission is a nonprofit organization that's made up of lawyers, investigators, social workers, and other professionals that come alongside other governments and help them rescue individuals um, who are suffering injustice, prosecute the perpetrators of those offenses, uh, develop rehabilitation or aftercare systems for the people who are victims of those crimes, and really seek structural transformational change. Uh, it is a dynamic organization uh, the team in India focuses its work on human trafficking and slavery offenses. But in other regions of the world, International Justice Mission's work includes land grabbing, um, unprosecuted rapes, uh, and all sorts of other um, injustices that people suffer. After I completed my time in India, I returned to the, to the United States, where at, and there I do get to prosecute criminal civil rights crimes all over the country. Um, and especially trafficking crimes now that we started a human trafficking prosecution unit. Uh, I love my job. So I need to say that my words here tonight are solely my own. 
and nothing should be attributed to the United States government, the Department of Justice, <laughs> Attorney General Holder, or anybody else. I'm here in my personal capacity, and uh, I appreciate that you can respect that. The topic that you all have chosen for this week is Jesus, Justice, and Poverty. And I was specifically invited here to talk to you about the intersection between faith and social justice. Now, obviously, many people pursue justice and fight poverty without any direct reference to faith, and they, and they do great work. Uh, and I often get the opportunity to talk about human trafficking, human rights, uh, prosecution tactics, the pros and cons of a casework methodology, and I enjoy that. And we actually got to do a little bit of that this afternoon at the law school here. But tonight, I'm actually excited to get the opportunity to, in addition to perhaps touching on those topics, to talk about the, the, that intersection between faith and social justice. Not only is a passion for social justice and faith complementary, I think when, when faith moves a person to fight for social justice, I think dramatic change can come, transform, transformational change. And for me, um, that is focused on the issue of slavery, but the same principles apply in the pursuit of other issues related to social justice and other passions. Let's start with some basic facts. Because the terms human trafficking and slavery are confusing in our, in our culture. The word slavery conjures up far-reaching images from Caesar inscripting defeated foes to the Pharaoh oppressing the Hebrews, Japan's brutal regime throughout Asia, King Leopold's barbaric reign in the Belgian Congo, British tyrants pioneering the African slave trade or the United States perfecting the exploitation of African slaves. It sends our mind on a journey, sort of recounting period movies about unenlightened ancestors and the horrors that they perpetrated or that they endured. In my mind, when I think about slavery sometimes, it's instantly black and white, like an old television, an old television show. It appears on our collective consciousness as a historical blight and not necessarily a modern day problem. It's difficult to imagine that my parents grew up in an era of white and colored water fountains. As an American, it thinks absurd to, to believe that systematic and even institutionalized slavery continues to persist long after the end of our bloody civil war in 1865. But it shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us that slavery exists. We've seen the depraved human nature that the philosophers have taught us about over the years. Uh, we know that we still have to teach our children to share. We know that some students still cheat on tests. We know that we still lock our doors at night because we don't want burglars to come in and take our property. I mean, since the fall of institutionalized slavery in America, we've witnessed the Holocaust, calculated terrorist attacks, and seemingly random acts of violence at Columbine, Virginia Tech, and most recently Fort Hood. And it's upon this backdrop of continued depravity that the evil of slavery continues to thrive. So I ask you, have you ever met a slave? I hadn't. I hadn't met a slave until 2002 when I began my work in India. And one of the very first cases I did involved 63 slaves on a rock quarry known, owned by a man named Ramasamy. These 63 people represented 15 families, and they had worked on this rock quarry for years. They were being forced, and they were not free to leave. They were desperate for rescue. They were desperate for someone to come in and challenge the institutionalized structure. The one that accepts that the fact that they are scheduled or untouchables means that it is their duty and destiny to serve others for no pay and without freedom. These were men and women and children together as families being forced to work. Now, during the trial of Ramasamy, I got an opportunity to do what, what lawyers dream about doing in a trial, and that is to call the unexpected. And Ramasamy was so mad about it. He sat there as a wealthy landowner, owned this rock quarry, was making him tons of money on the backs of these people. 
and I called two young 14-year-old girls, which he thought was ridiculous. First of all, they were low caste and untouchable. Why would they speak in court? They weren't even adults. And worse, they were women, girls, to speak against him. But they did. Boldly recounted how at the age of nine they were forced to drop out of school and break rocks all day long. By the end of that trial, Ramasamy was convicted, and those girls got to go to school. Now, some people might think that this is an interesting story by some activist bent on manipulating emotions to further his cause. It could be anecdotal. You know, we often discount the crusader types that, that pine away for their, um, for their cause, have lost their tether to reality, pursuing this utopian dream. I wondered myself, as a new person in India, is it real? Is this just an anecdote? But over the course of, of subsequent raids, over and over and over again, watching the same thing play out, I realized that it is, it is not an anecdote. I became convinced that slavery really does exist. Many people have tried to quantify, that is, measure how many people are actually in slavery today, how many people are victims of human trafficking. And as with any criminal enterprise, it's not an exact science. It's a hidden crime. It's hard to know the exact number. National Geographic reported that 27 million people worldwide are bought sold, held captive, brutalized, and exploited for profit. Two-thirds, according to the National Geographic report, two-thirds of the slaves, 15 to 20 million people, are dead slaves in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Nepal. That means, and has been often quoted, that there are more slaves in the world today than were, than were trafficked in all 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade. The population of Iowa, about 3 million. If National Geographic's report is right, there are nine times the population of India in slavery. In 2005, the International Labor Organization estimated that there are 12.3 million people as forced laborers in the world. And the National Human Rights Institute in Bangalore, India, estimated that there are 65 million slaves in India alone. Nobody knows the exact number. But I think everyone can agree that there are way too many. That it is a significant problem. And so regardless of the exact number of slaves, extreme efforts have to be exerted in order for this inhumane criminal problem to be dealt with. There are also a few myths about human trafficking that I'd just like to mention. One is that trafficking all of human beings always involves the transportation of individuals across borders or state lines. That's not the case. It's a bit of a misnomer. Trafficking suggests movement. But the reality is the focus is on compelled, coerced labor or services. Another is that it always deals with some sort of international connection, that you take people from one location and move them to a new nation. That's not the case. Many slaves are trafficked within their own country. Many victims of human trafficking are victimized by their own people. It used to be that people considered enslaving other races, people different from them. It's not the case with modern-day slavery. Many of the same race, the same ethnicity, the same nation, the same languages and caste will enslave one another. Other people think all human trafficking focuses on commercial sexual exploitation. But that's a myth. There are lots of people being trafficked for non-commercial sex work. That is, work in restaurants, uh, work in bars, work in factories, fields, and individual schools. <coughs> so slavery exists. Uh, the myths about it can be debunked. Uh, but what I, what I want to talk about a bit tonight is how this personal faith intersects with the scourge of slavery or any other issue. And as I think about that intersection and pondered it, I was drawn to Barna Group's 2007 book, Unchristian. The book analyzes a survey about how Americans think and perceive faith. 
The book begins with this stinging indictment. It says Christianity has an image problem. People have little trust in the Christian faith, and esteem for the lifestyle of Christ's followers quickly is fading among outsiders. They admit their emotional and intellectual barriers go up when they are around Christians, and they reject Jesus because they feel rejected by Christians. The problem is that many see very little that is truly compelling about the lives of people of faith. They think that Christians are judgmental, prudish, intolerant, and repressed. Even worse, I think many people think that Christianity is just irrelevant when it comes to the issues of our day. That followers of Christ are more interested in controlling other people's behaviors to take away fun, to take away parties, to take away freedoms, and replace them with an immense sense of shame, guilt, and fear. They don't see a role in faith for dealing with the social justice issues of our day. And sadly, as people of faith, we provide far too much anecdotal evidence to support their theory. But their theory is wrong. There is a deep need for authentic, active, and engaged faith. We are all seeking that authenticity. That's something real. And when I was working with IGN in India, I met a man who had that. His name was Nagaraj. <coughs> Nagaraj was a slave in southern Tamil Nadu, and he was searching for something real. He woke up, and he realized that his children would be slaves for the rest of their lives. That he was born into slavery, that he was living in slavery, and this was all his children could hope for, to work under this brutal brick kiln hunter. And so he decided that he was going to try and do something. His owner allowed him to go out to a market a few hours, one day a week. All the rest of the time he had to be inside the compound. So he went out, and he was walking by all the idols, all these different gods, Shiva, Vishnu, Ganesh, and he prayed to each of them that something would change. He also saw a portrait of Jesus, and he prayed to it that something would change. Two days after he prayed those prayers, he met two investigators from the International Justice Mission. Now, according to Nagaraj, his prayers were answered. Some might say it's circumstance or happenstance or coincidence. The two people that he met, he told them that Jesus and Shiva had sent them, and they seemed very confused because they thought I actually sent them on that mission. <laughs> I was not up there on the list of gods. <laughs> but regardless of what you think of Nagarantha's prayers, or even the, even the concept of prayer, the personal faith that Nagaraj was developing within himself was readying himself, preparing himself for the battle for his own freedom. He found hope that there could even be a change in the idea that there was a God. And it is that hope for the future that allows people to dream that they could be free. And over the course of the next month, we, that is IJM, we worked with Nagarash to sneak people in and out of the brick kiln when the owner wasn't, wasn't noticing or when he was drunk. And we would document their story. We took their pictures. We prepared an intervention report. Finally, when we had amassed as much evidence as we possibly thought we could get, we took it to the government. We sat down with the police with whom we had been building relationships through doing other cases. And we said, this case is ready to raid. The government was kind of hesitant. This owner, like all owners are important. They're all landowners, they're all wealthy, but this one was really, really wealthy. He was powerful, connected. In fact, the superintendent of police knew him personally. But as we walked through the evidence, he said, we must go. And we did. The raid happened. The slaves were rescued. And these individuals, these investigators from IGM that I get to call my friends, did amazing work. They were, in a sense, the authentic Christ, something real, something that was worthy of being esteemed 
as God's representative in their personal faith to Nagaraj as he was seeking to develop his own. <clears throat> Many of us are tired of half-truths and hypocrisy. We want to follow a God that matters. A God that turns our daily work into ministry and a God that loves deeply. And too often, we do not see this example of authentic faith, this authentic Christ in our daily lives, in the religious elite of our day. But instead of focusing just on the flawed followers of God, I want to focus on Christ himself for a moment. I wonder if we could peel back our own culture and our own tradition and get a glimpse of this authentic Christ and what he cares about. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? It's a familiar refrain. He, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. It is hard for us today to realize what a radical statement that is. You see, there had been a debate raging at that time about the ranking of the laws of the Torah, the 613 laws. And most agree that Deuteronomy 6.5, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, was number one. No one really disagreed about that. But there was great disagreement about number two. The majority position at the time was Leviticus 19.2, be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And by putting loving others before personal purity rules, Christ disrupted the power structure. He turned things upside down. Violations of these purity rules, like what food you could eat or what animals you could touch, these things would render you unclean and exclude you from the temple. And all sorts of things left people unclean. Even wearing clothes woven from two different types of material. If anyone with a rash, a deformity, anyone who touches them, they're all deemed unclean. Leviticus 21.18 tells us, No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. Philip Yancey puts it this way, No oddballs or misfits alike. To be clear, there was plenty of Jewish charity, and there was some community for those deemed unclean. But the religious culture then, and many would argue the religious culture today, trended towards personal purity issues and not radical service to others. And it didn't take long for people to get the message, stay clean. Don't do anything that might make you impure or unclean. And don't touch people who are unclean. In a completely different context in India, I saw firsthand what it was like for a group of people to be deemed untouchable. I remember distinctly when IGM raided a sweet stall factory where they were making um, Indian sweets to sell in the various stalls. Rescued uh, a little over a dozen slaves from that facility, and they received their official release certificates, their individual emancipation proclamations from the government. And they went back to their homes and we were setting them up where they could live. Because before they lived on their owner's property, and now, of course, he wasn't very interested in, in having them live on his property since he uh, was being charged with a crime. And they needed a place where they had access to water. And the authorities um, explained to me which well they would get to use. And as they did, a mob began to form around that well. And a riot was about to break out. Because these people cannot drink out of the same well that everyone else in the town can drink of. Because they are untouchables. And we sat there and we explained that they are full members of this society. They are entitled to public services. And that, quite frankly, these local government officials, I think they, I think they actually felt a lot of sympathy for these guys. and didn't mind them getting water from the well. But it was that crowd that they could not control. And the hills, there's just no way. And so one of our young advocates crossed his own caste lines and began to advocate on behalf of these people. 
For two weeks, we actually had to bring in lorries or trucks of water to help sustain them. And so finally, we won the day through persistent advocacy. Because it doesn't happen quickly. It doesn't happen without conflict. It requires people to say, I care enough that I'm going to touch. I care enough that I'm going to be a part of what's happening. Eventually, they got their water. Christ wanted to root out any kind of idea that his purpose was to build a religion of rules that bind people. When he first announced his ministry, he stood in the temple, he unfurled the scrolls, and read from the prophet Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These were radical words. Jesus was shaking up the establishment and the status quo. In making this bold statement about the poor and the blind, the prisoners and the oppressed, he was shattering the wish dreams of the community, forcing them to embrace an engaged Savior that was willing to be unclean. And only Christ's actions were more sensational than his proclamation. He spent most of his ministry ceremonially unclean, touching the unclean, allowing the bleeding female to touch him, spending time with Gentiles, foreigners, and aliens, dining with prostitutes and adulterers, tax collectors, the woman at the well who had been married five times, the man born blind. These were the people that he was touching, that he was engaging with. This is the authentic Jesus, the authentic faith, who declares what comes out of us, our attitudes and our actions, determine whether or not we are clean. It's not about the observance of nitpicky or very important rules. Jesus affirms that God cares deeply about people who are suffering because they lack the essentials of life, that they lack food, water, shelter, education, and basic medical care. And there are lots of scriptures that direct us to care for these people. He does not want the blind and the young to be, or the infected to be prevented from coming to him because they're unclean. But there's another group of people. There's another group of people who have their basic needs met, who may have food and shelter and clothing, but who suffer from something else, who suffer because there is a person of power who is using that power to exploit and oppress them. And Jesus tells us he cares about those people too. And his plan for loving them is the same as his plan for loving everyone else, and that is to use his people. <clears throat> Isaiah 1.17 says, Learn to do what is right. Seek justice. Encourage the oppressed. Defend the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. A clarion call to action. To apply personal faith to these issues, these social justice issues. And who better than the recipients of unmerited favor and grace to seek justice and plead for the oppressed, to care for the weak, the oddballs, and the misfits. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells us that when we love the least of these, the unclean and the unwanted, we are actually loving Christ himself. It took me a while to sort of grasp that concept, this idea that within God's creation, within his people, we can see his presence and we can care for him by caring for others. He made them in his image. And each of them are reminders of God's mercy and compassion. And this is the Jesus we're called to imitate. It says, be imitators of God, and that our attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And Luke 6 says, be compassionate just as he is compassionate. And as we seek to imitate our Messiah, we have to let go of our expectations and our sense of entitlement. God calls us to exchange our limited temporal and often selfish passions for his unlimited, eternal, and selfless passions. <clears throat> Thomas Merton recognized that imitating God was more important than personal purity when he stated the Christian who wants to imitate his master must learn to do so not by imposing a crude and violent control on his emotions, 
by letting grace form and develop his emotional life in the service of charity. My friends working with Nagaraj all the way around the world did great work. And he is just one of many, many people they have cared for. And I had the honor not too long ago to sit down with Nagaraj. But it was not in India. It was at my home in Virginia. When Nagaraj came to speak before Congress and to speak to people and tell them about modern-day slavery. And he told me about what has transformed in his village. Nagaraj, might not surprise you, now owns his own brick kiln, where he employs people and has promised me he pays them the right market wage. <laughs> and explains to me in detail for a long period of time why his bricks are so far superior to any other brick made in any surrounding village. I learned more about brick making than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> His life had changed in the life of the 300 people that worked at that massive brick kiln. <clears throat> Some people, life may not have changed as, as much in terms of owning their own kiln, but they're working. They have a chance to go try. They have a chance to be free. I've had people ask me, you know, you rescue them from a, a bad situation. Well, what do you rescue them into? What happens after their rescue? And honestly, sometimes I didn't have the answer. One time I stood before a group of individuals, and they had been rescued, but they had nowhere to go. They had no access to food. They had been blacklisted throughout the community. No one would let them work. No one would let them buy provisions. And so every week, I would take a train, overnight train, and I'd bring with them sacks of rice and oil and whatever they needed. But I realized, I can't be doing this. This isn't sustainable. This isn't going to work. And so I, finally I asked the group, because I was feeling pretty discouraged. I said, I mean, do any of you guys just feel like selling yourselves back into slavery? I mean, at least you had at least one meal every day. The crowd was sort of quiet. And this one man, middle-aged, sort of graying on the top of his head, stood up and in a very quiet and confident voice said, I would rather die than ever be a slave again. And I just sat there stunned, seeking encouragement from this man, because he had the courage that I needed. I can tell you that that situation did get better. And we actually, through a, a process of asset forfeiture, took the rock quarry that he had been enslaved in from the owner, and actually it's now owned as a communal property with all the former slaves. Which is just fun as a lawyer. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's just fun to take the bad guy's property as much as it is to do anything else. <laughs> Brennan Manning described it this way. To have the mind of Christ is to think his thoughts, share his ideals, dream his dreams, throb with his desires, replace our natural responses to persons and situations with the concern of Jesus, to make the mindset of Christ so completely our own that the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's the mind, the mind of Christ. So what is God passionate about? If we're to follow his passions and have his attitude, we must find out what is he passionate about. Well, I think it's simple. He's passionate about the stuff he made. He's passionate about the air, and he wants it pure. He's passionate about the water, and he wants it clean. He's passionate about those who are weak, and he wants them protected. He's passionate about those in Darfur, and he wants them safe. He's passionate about those who are lonely, and he wants them befriended. About those who are lost, and he wants them to hear the truth. Those who are exploited, he wants advocates for. Those who have been orphaned, he wants parented. Those who are in prison, he wants their rights protected. Those he made with brown skin and white skin, he wants them treated fairly. Those who are oppressed in slavery, he wants them rescued. And those who are unclean by our standards, he wants them loved. 
There is nothing to support the idea that God is apathetic or ambivalent about our lives or our world. So we should join God in all of these passions, or one of them, or two. We should imitate Him. And if we want to join, if you want to join His passion for justice, for human trafficking, or anything else, join. Come to the field. Get in the trenches. There's work to be done. If not, it's fine too. But pursue God with a passion He's passionate about as an authentic follower of the authentic, engaged Christ. God wants us all involved, getting our hands dirty. He wants us more interested in serving others than maintaining our purity, our comfort, our reputation, our financial security. Or as one of my good friends put it, who went to work on the International Justice Mission overseas, he was worried that when he returned from overseas, not only would he, he be unemployable, not only would he have lost all his money, not only would no one think that he was cool, but that he would spend the rest of his life driving a bad car wearing crappy slacks. <laughs> but he went anyway, giving up his firm job and going and doing the work. If you're interested in what the International Justice Mission is doing, there is information, I believe, in the back. There are bookmarks and information about how to start a camp, campus chapter, <coughs> information about what they're doing in terms of casework around the world. They have a website at IGM.org. But it's one of many ways to get involved and engaged. God said, imitate me. So what kind of of Jesus are we going to imitate? Are we going to imitate a politically conservative Jesus? A Republican Jesus? A Democrat Jesus? Are we going to imitate a Jesus that is comfortable with the status quo? Are we going to hide ourselves away in our neighborhoods, hang out with people that are like us, people that don't push us, are we going to be average at what we pursue, whether it's our studies or our work? Or are we going to be excellent? These are questions worth answering. I think we should be the people who imitate the engaged Jesus. The Jesus who loves. And the challenge today is for us to distinguish what are the silly rules in our day? What are the needless traditions? What are the barriers to engagement? And when we find them, we should destroy them. And we should go to the people. This will bring about transformation, not just in human trafficking, but in, in numerous other issues. And I think it will bring us great joy. Thank you guys for letting me be here tonight. I'd be glad to answer any of your questions about trafficking or any other matters. We will now uh, take your questions or comments. Please keep them uh, short and uh, to the point, please. <laughs> Um, I, I would like to thank you so much for coming tonight um, and for your talk and the work that you do with IMJ. My, my question is, you mentioned IM, IJM excuse me, works for structural transformational change. And I would like to know, is that change possible without a spiritual transformation? Um, you talked about, I don't remember his name, but the man who prayed to the different gods and to Jesus. And um, are changes effective without the spiritual component? Or does IJM take into consideration the spiritual transformation in the lives of the people that they help? Or does it not go beyond um, that type of change? Yeah, I think that's a good question in terms of um, is spiritual uh, change required for, for there to be real transformative structural change in the community? And then also with IGM's role in terms of it, how it views faith in, in the people that it serves. 
A couple points to answer that. One is that iJam doesn't put a test on people that it's going to help. That is, it helps everybody. It doesn't just find where their questions are being, being exploited and just help them. So there's no faith-based test for that. The folks who work at iJam are motivated by their faith in Christ, and they're understanding how Christ has rescued them to go and, and in turn, rescue others. The, um, there's also the sense that if someone is trapped in a brothel and they can't get out, it doesn't matter to her that there is a new church plant down the block. She can't go. And so, in a sense, just getting her out and getting her free allows all the other aspects of what, what God's work is doing to be fulfilled. That she can now have access to the same, she can now be educated, she can do all these other things. Um, IJM, because it's working in so many different countries and engaging with the government, is not engaged in proselytizing activities. Um, it is engaged in being very clear about why it cares about people and that those people need the full range of services that they could seek out in a, in a free society. In terms of can real change come without, <coughs> excuse me, without um, spiritual change, obviously, you know, from a perspective of faith, we want people rescued not just for this life. We want them rescued for eternity. Um, and so I, I would say there are sort of two answers. There can be real dynamic change that can come even in, in communities um, from just getting people out, just stopping the system. Uh, and then I think there's a, there's a spiritual over, overlay that needs to come in. And obviously people who have been drawn to Christ um, or are interested should have the opportunity to pursue him. So, I, but I do think it matters just to just to feed the hungry, just to just to rescue the oppressed. That alone, I think, is worship and, and glorifying. Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Chris Grill from the Daily Island, so I have kind of a local question. Hopefully, that you can address. Um, Iowa became the 14th state in the nation to develop its own human trafficking laws. Uh, and I was wondering if you might be able to address uh, human trafficking on a state or a national level. And then we also had a public forum discussion in January. Uh, maybe if you could also talk about the importance of public discussion and bringing awareness to the issue on a state and national level also. John, please uh, briefly repeat the question for Channel 4 listeners. Um, the, the question was about Iowa's new human trafficking statute um, and what sort of awareness needs to be done regarding trafficking on state and national level. I, I read the new trafficking statute in Iowa. Um, I can't speak to the, the substance or content of it. I can tell you that there are, there are a number of states that have passed uh, tra trafficking bills um, there's obviously uh, a renewed emphasis from the federal perspective with the Trafficking Victims Protection Act that was passed in 2000. Um, and state and federal law enforcement um, have been working aggressively together on cases throughout the country. There are numerous federal, local, and state task forces that have been formed to investigate um, and prosecute trafficking offenses. So I, I think what is um, what is essential is that people know what to look for when, when, they're, when they see someone that might be a victim of human trafficking. And that can come through training of local law enforcement, training of nonprofit groups, um, so that when something happens, when an individual outcries or, or bursts out and says, I need help, that we, that we don't just immediately presume um, that every girl in a, a brothel or everyone working in the sex industry is there on their own shoes. They may be, they may not be. Maybe there's some questions we can ask. Maybe the new statute that we have, and I assume the one in Iowa, is a victim-centered statute where we're not prosecuting the, the women, um, particularly commercial sexual exploitation, as, as perpetrators or as individuals that need to be held criminally accountable, but instead as victims of someone else. We can also see that in domestic servant cases where individuals have a domestic servant in their house that they're abusing. We've seen it in, in restaurants and factories, uh, plantations, uh, all over where these individuals are being forced to work against their will. 
And so we, there, there are warning signs to look for. That is not every undocumented person needs to be immediately put in, um, in, into some sort of category that um, they're here illegally and therefore they haven't been convicted of a crime. There are undocumented individuals in the United States that are being trapped. There are undocumented individuals in the United States that have not been trapped. And if they did the victim of the human trafficking crime, we want to know so that we can determine what the appropriate redress is, whether it's state prosecution, federal prosecution, or otherwise. My question is a bit of a follow-up to that one, and that's um, a matter of what um, IJM and also in your work now with the Department of Justice, how much of a priority um, dealing with slavery and human trafficking in the United States now is seen? Is it really seen as, as a major problem, or do we see other things as bigger deals? And so they assign some people to work on it, but maybe not a lot of them. In terms of the resources, <laughs> yeah. In terms, of, the, the question is about the, the resources that the government's um, uh, devoting to pursuing trafficking. Um, obviously, there are are lots of important issues to you know across the nation, and so uh, each of those issues get attention um, within the civil rights division. Um, you know, human trafficking is an important issue, as are voting rights and housing discrimination and hate crimes and everything else, and so. Um, what I perceive are, are just an amazing group of individuals that are working very hard, uh, that are committed to the cause and bringing great cases. I, I haven't, I mean, um, I'm not sure I understand your question in terms of, of, of how to measure that, but I can tell you that there are uh, significant resources being put forth towards all types of, of civil rights work. I'm a junior undergrad here. Um, I have a personal question for you. As a Christian doing um, human rights advocacy work, um, doing it both for a Christian non-governmental organization and now for a secular governmental organization, can you talk about how that um, affected your work and your faith and um, kind of the differences between the two, especially for a young person wanting to go into this field um, of faith, um, just kind of the differences and in, in what you see as a benefit or a um, negative for each. Um, question. The, the, the question is the difference between doing this type of work in a, for a faith-based organization and doing it for um, a governmental organization. To be honest with you, I haven't seen a great deal of difference. I think that um, you know, organizational, all organizations have their own sort of internal issues and things like that, but I think that um, it, the people that you work with are, are just and then when they're amazing people, and the people I worked with in India were amazing, and the people I worked with in the Department of Justice were amazing, and uh, I, I have not found this sort of great divide between the secular and the spiritual in in my work. Uh, you know, obviously there are some, some 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 distinctives about what we can do. And when we were um, when I was working for IGM in India, we didn't have police power. We couldn't. We had to get them to go do it. You know. Now, you know, it's, when I'm working on a case, um, I get to be a little more corrective in that. Uh, so, so that is a significant difference. But um, from a daily, you know, like what I do and how I go about it, um, I haven't seen a great distinction. Uh, yeah, my question is, since we're in a university, um, for students who might be interested in going into a field similar to yours, or in justice in general, do you have recommendations as to which classes they might take or literature that they might read um, that might kind of prepare them um, for your line of work or justice-related work? In terms of what courses to take or what things to read to prepare for being involved in this type of work, um, I would say read broadly. Uh, read all the read as much as you can about uh, different perspectives on this work. There are numerous different schools of thought and perspectives. A lot of people have written about trafficking um, and lay it out. Some is better than others, and you can draw some of those um, comparisons. I think um, in terms of what classes to take, you know, obviously if, um, if you're going to pursue it from an investigative strategy, everyone, if you're going to pursue it from a legal place, you know, there's some obvious 
changes in terms of what you would take there. Um, I would just do as well as you can at everything you do take. I think that's honestly more important than um, this sort of specifically what class you take during your freshman or junior or senior year. Um, I mean, if you have a specific goal in mind, that's great, but I just, I just think people should be excellent. I mean, to the best they can do. Um, I think that's a way that we honor um, our faith and our God. I think it's too often people think that grace has to do with why they need an extension instead of grace being something they receive from God. You know, we actually should be doing things on time. <laughs> we ought to be getting things done well. And I think that I think that's a great way to to, to display the fact that um, that God's real. You know, I want if I could could define a world, it would be one in which when people heard that someone who, who has a firm belief in God has not aborted the life of the mind. That is, they haven't given up on thinking. <coughs> that, that, you know what, if someone is a first baby, you can, you can take it to the bank that they're going to have their work done, ready, on time, and it's going to be well done. That would be great. Um, when you're talking about, like, the the investigation of the guy who was a really powerful rich owner in India, or the landowner in India. I was kind of wondering, like, what sort of a time frame we're talking about? Like, how long do these investigations carry on? Like, to what extent do you have to have this mountain of evidence piled up so that the, the police officials there are actually going to take action? You know, like, how does that work? What's the time frame? The, the question about the time frame for investigations in India. During my time there, um, it varied. Some cases went very quickly, and some cases took a lot longer. The one that, that you're speaking of involving Nagaraj, that case took a while. We spent a lot of time. Obviously, the bigger your target, the more, the more information you want if you're going to motivate um, and get enough political will to go after it. And so, you know, we definitely took our time, <laughs> down our eyes, and crossed our T's. We wanted to, we wanted to make sure we had them in our sights. Um, other cases, you know, you move, you move much more rapidly. Um, you know, obviously, if there are exigent circumstances, you know, bad things are happening that are severe. You, sometimes you, you, you move in with the police, and you're not exactly sure what's going to happen. So, I think that in terms of the time frame, it varied from, from a few days to months. So thanks again for all the information you offered. I have um, two questions. The first one is earlier in the talk, you, you made a statement about how some people say um, concerning slavery, which you worked with, Christianity is irrelevant. And some people actually use the scriptures, which um, give the implication. At least let's, let's keep the Old Testament away for a while. But like the New Testament, um, claiming that you know Christians didn't try to get rid of this slavery thing. Um, in the New Testament. How do you face that? How do you handle that? And the second part is, so later on in your talk, you talk about, I think, this, this guy that you just mentioned and the guy, the bad guy you, you took him away from. But I'm, I'm, I'm looking from a spiritual perspective too. Um, what happens to the bad guys? Do you, I mean, are you concerned about the bad guys as well? Um, I mean, it may not have anything to do with like, the justice aspect, per se, in the human sense, but like, just on a personal level, like, do you get to interact with them? Do you get to, um, get to talk to them or anything? Mm -hmm. the, the question was about, um, about scripture that, that could be used or people have used in the past to support slavery. And then also, what about perpetrators and how do we approach or view them? I, I can tell you that, um, that people have, have used scripture to justify so many different things that um, I look to the whole of the God that I know and, and, and to the heart of what I see in scripture, which is, I think, fairly consistently against slavery, from you know, God seeking to rescue his own people from Egypt um, to God saying that we're all slaves to sin and we all need to be rescued from that. It also... I, I don't want to give too much credence to those who will, who will twist and use things to exploit folks. The example of Christ is really clear. He never, he never used 
his power. He never used his knowledge of scripture to take to take anyone down a peg. It was to lift them up always. He spoke truth and love, and I think that um, I think that the justifications, the biblical justifications for slavery, um, do uh, our faith in God a great disservice. In terms of um, how we view the perpetrators, our contact with them is limited because in a lot of ways we were working with the prosecution. The, the individuals, the perpetrators, were undoubtedly represented by counsel. Um, and so we weren't having any, any regular interaction with them uh, without, their, without their attorneys. View them as human. They're created by God, too. You know? And you know, one, I think one of the great things about our legal system, and, and in many sense the legal system in India, because it, it's crafted in wholly after British common law, is that we don't try people for being bad people. Like that's never what, what we have to do in the criminal law. We try people for acts. What did they do on that day? If someone's being on, you know, on trial for, for robbing a house, it's not, you know, this person is a robber. No, it's on this specific day, at this specific time, they broke into the house. You know, that person was a mom. <coughs> that person you know, had, a, had a childhood. That, we don't ever have to prove that they're a bad person. Because if they did something wrong. And I think that's the approach that, that we take when we look at, at perpetrators and, and hope that they can be restored um, as well and, and live in a society where they don't perpetrate these crimes. But the bottom line is we want them to stop. And if they're not willing to stop, we stop. I mean, using the rule of law, using public justice systems, we stop them. Hi. Um, thank you so much for coming and speaking today. Um, my question is, uh, you have the opportunity through your work to help and interact with people who are working in exploitative conditions every day. But in a way, we all interact with these people every day through our consumer choices, um, you know, the clothes that we wear and the food that we eat. So I'm wondering how we just as everyday people in this country can deal with the hypocrisy of believing that there needs to be changes in the world and living in an economy where that's really difficult to do? The, the question's about um, the hypocrisy of living in a world in which the economy um, may very well be selling products that we buy that were somehow touched by human trafficking or child labor or perhaps other exploited practices. Um, I think it's hard. I, I'm not sure that I have a, a, a real answer to that. You know, it's hard to know where things uh, were made or how they were made. Um, even certifications, if, if they come about, uh, it's hard to know how they were certified and you know, what kind of investigation was done into that. I think we just have to use our, our sort of good reason and common sense about how we make things in the same form uh, to read and to understand where things are coming from. Um, there's lots of media attention right now on uh, different countries and what's going on, as well as our country and the problems that we have. And I think the best thing we can do right now is just be aware and concerned and try to make individual choices based on sort of good reason and judgment. Hi. Thanks for coming. I want to say that I love what you do and I love what drives you. But I work for a local NGO who works with domesticated um, trafficked minors, and I have a few questions about the law. First, do you think it's better to go after state or federal law? And second, um, when you're working with the domestic, what are some of the laws that I can look into that will help get some of the services for the domestic minors? I know that like with the TIP law, a lot of it is earmarked for foreign born. So, um, like I know racketeering and stuff like that, but do you know of any others I can investigate? I can talk to the actor about some specific things regarding that. <laughs> probably, the, probably the best way to, to approach it in terms of what sort of resources are available for U.S. citizen victims um, as opposed to continued presence or whatever. Okay, my question is that um, how does someone become a slave? And more specifically, you gave the example of the man who prayed to the different gods. Um, how did that man become a slave? And what's his story? Kind of? The question is, how, how do people become slaves? And the slaves that I met in India had different stories. Um, the, the individual that I mentioned, Nagaraj, 
Um, he had been a slave uh, his whole life and bounced around from Brooklyn to Brooklyn. He even sold to several different people uh, as his family sort of moved around the, the village. But um, that, that was it. He was born into it. I met a man um, named Mark Lapa, who was, I think he must have been 76 when he was rescued and had been a slave his whole life. He was born into it. He worked on a plantation. He was so old and frail, he just sat under the tree, and his job was to be watchman at that point. But he couldn't really do anything uh, productive in terms of, uh, of that. Uh, I can tell you that there is a, a young woman who has um, was one of our cases um, who I think has an amazing story. And her name is Jyoti, and she has given IJM and us, and me specifically, the permission to use her name and tell her story from time to time. Um, her father uh, needed some sort of eye operation, as best she recalls. Uh, and so they sold her to a brick kiln in East India. She worked there, and it was awful. Uh, she was mistreated. She was a young woman coming into her, her own at that time. And uh, she finally, it was so violent, and the work was so bad, that she ran away. As she got to the train station, after having worked in this, in this brick kiln for um, what I'm getting, I never could get the dates exactly right, but it sounded like about six months. She got to the train station, she was, um, she was mugged. And, um, rendered unconscious by some sort of drug, and she woke up in Bombay, all the way across the country. And she spent the next two years in a brothel. Uh, the first week, she was just raped repeatedly until um, she they, they basically forced submission. Um, and then she did as many tricks as they told her to do each day, until finally, um, IJM, interestingly enough, did a raid at that brothel, she was rescued. I met I met JT because she was on her I was asked to help him with the rehabilitation plan and we were taking her back to her native place. It was during the conversation about where she's from that I learned that she had been enslaved in a brick kiln long before she had ever been enslaved in a brothel. So we went back up and we just made it our campaign to take out this brick kiln hunter. And we did, and it was so amazing to watch this woman who had literally been twice rescued um, from that situation. So she went into slavery because of a medical need that her father had. Other people, um, it's, it's just greed. They will sell other people to, because it is a way to make money. Uh, they will sell nieces and nephews. Um, and obviously, uh, w women who uh, and young girls are often seen as less valuable um, get sold more quickly. John, could you elaborate on people born into slavery? I remember the story of the family who owed, borrowed ten dollars and ended up three or four generations in slavery. It, it definitely happens. I mean, that, the, the generational aspect of this is particularly troubling because it robs people of hope for the future as they don't see anything different. If you were raised free and you had opportunity, then as you as you go through your life and you're being oppressed, you remember that, you you cherish it, you romanticize it, you say you want to get back to it. But if all you've ever known is, is slavery, and it's generational, your parents may not even remember it, you're in that third generation piece, it's hard to even understand what the alternatives could be. And in India, we have experienced times where we would um, actually be explaining to people that they have an option that they can leave, and they would be initially resistant. Leave to do what? You know, what, what? What are you talking about? No one ever leaves. This is my destiny. This is what I was created to do. Um, but that was the exception. Most of the time, some of those magical moments were when people would, would finally uh, get their release certificates. And at the end of a long, hot day, uh, you're ready to start early in the morning, and it was time to leave. And they would pack up their meager belongings in a couple sacks in an instant, and with beaming smiles, they would head to the trucks or to the buses or whatever we could find to help transport them, not having a clue where they were going next or what was going to happen. And it always surprised me because I thought about, you know, when my family has moved, sometimes moving can be a little stressful, the details, and, you know, what it would be like if I was moving my family on a moment's notice. 
these guys are just smiles. And it really took me to the place where when you're when what you're leaving is that bad, it almost doesn't matter what's gonna happen next. And obviously we weren't gonna let just anything happen. We were working with the government to make sure there were plans and rehabilitation and ways to make sure their, their needs were met as they got back on their feet. Um, how do you find or identify these victims of trafficking? We would um, find them in a couple of different ways. Sometimes, in terms of how do we find the victims of trafficking, in India we, we use several different strategies to do it. One was people would call us and tell us there were problems. Believe it or not, we actually have officials, government officials from time to call us and tell us, we have a problem, we'd love for you to come and look into it. In the sense, if you know, if this NGO's here, they can kind of sit back politically and say, ah, what are we going to do? They're here, they have you on videotape, you know. <laughs> yeah, and they kind of, they walk that nice political line. Other times, we had investigators that would go out. I mean, we quickly learned um, which industries were using slaves a lot. And after we had a couple quick rescues, and people started coming out, people talked. And that's where we get into this structural and transformative change. People would, would communicate, like it can be different. The word would get around through these, um, through these villages. And other rescued slaves would tell us, I've got a cousin over there, he's in, it's the same thing. And then of course, you know, we wouldn't necessarily believe that. We would do an investigation and it would be reviewed and we'd get corroboration. And, you know, we kind of march through the process of building a case. Um, but a lot of our um, a lot of our tips came from people who had already been rescued, from government officials, from other NGOs, um, and from our investigators. In in some ways, um, stumbling upon it. How does the United States compare with other countries as far as perpetrators and users of of the, the people that need to be rescued? Are we worse, better, um, average from other countries? Yeah, in terms of how the United States compares to other countries in terms of trafficking, um, I'm not sure I, I would know how to say. I mean, every country is so different in terms of what problem it's experiencing, um, and I haven't done any sort of comparative study. <coughs> I know that um, if you're interested, countries are compared in the um, trafficking and persons reports that are put out each summer by the State Department, and you're, you can review those to kind of get some sort of baseline. Um, I know that uh, in the United States, it's considered to be a significant problem, and, and therefore, people are working on it. Um, I'm not really knowledgeable in legal matters, but how is an American lawyer able to take a case and bring it in to like an Indian court? And what is the government, Indian government doing um, to stop human trafficking within their country? I mean, do they have any laws, or um, what's going on with that? Um, the, the question is, how, how does an American lawyer work in an Indian court, and what laws does India have regarding trafficking? Um, India has uh, really good laws regarding human trafficking, I think. And if enforced well, I think they would do a great job to combat the, the problem. They have laws against um, immoral trafficking, um, which would be sort of the sex trafficking piece. They have uh, forced labor and bonded labor uh, statutes. They've had those um, for years through their Indian Penal Code. It's, it was modeled um, after the British common law system. So they have good laws. Um, you know, everyone can argue about what would be better change or, or nuances and somewhat, but I mean, it, they, it's against the law, and India is a signatory to all the treaties. Um, and there's a lot of well-meaning, well-intentioned, hard-working Indian government officials that are working on this issue. Um, I've met some, I think they're friends, and uh, they care. And just like anywhere else, you know, there are folks who probably aren't quite as passionate about, about the issue and, and maybe not as eager to take up the case. As far as how I operate um, as an American lawyer, um, we built a staff, a team of Indian advocates that worked uh, with me side by side. And for the most part, the Indian advocates would go and, and do the, the court work. Um, there are some sort of more administrative things that I would do. Sometimes judges would be a little lenient and say, you know, you know they asked me to, to handle something. Um, but, you know, I don't practice law in India. I did get to teach Indian criminal law at some point, um, or at least for, 
forced, uh, forced labor human trafficking law at, at the University of the National Law School, but um, I'm not licensed to practice in India, I didn't practice in India. Instead, we used our Indian advocates, which quite frankly was far more compelling. You know, it's great to have someone who's from that country um, standing up. Everything that we did was based on Indian domestic laws. Like, there was no, no sense of coming in and saying, hey, you need to do it like we do in America. Uh, hey, you need to enforce this international treaty. You know, I think, in a sense, America gets to be involved with this with a great spirit of humility. We come to this with our own history. And we come to this as, as not people who are, are always right on this issue. We have a legacy. We have, we have a legacy that is dark and problematic. And so we can come humbly and say, we, we, we see this and, and we want to be a part of the solution. Hi, would you talk a little bit about the approach and process that IJM takes when initially building a relationship with a foreign government or legal system, um, either, I guess, prior to or during an investigation? And, and also, do you find that that initial contact is fairly well received or received skepticism, I guess? Uh, it was, in terms of how IJM builds relationships with governments, you know, I think that it's building relationships with people. And so it's a, the answer is as simple and as complex as that. You know, some individuals are easy to build relationships with, to build rapport with, and develop common ground. And I think just basic how to get along with people goes a long way, even cross-culturally. And showing respect, showing deference, you know, we're not there to air dirty laundry, we're not here to cause a problem, we are here to do what's right and to help you um, you know, if you don't want to help, that, that's okay. You know, it's just a system. It's your job. You, you, know, you need to push this through. Um, and to be an advocacy group in that regard. So some people are, are open to that. Some people are glad. Some people aren't. Um, even when they aren't, I think you could find a way to, to sort of bridge those divides. Um, but I, I do think, and I hope I'm not being too simplistic, that it is, it is just developing relationships with governments is like developing relationships with people. Because there are people in the government positions. Um, that includes the fact that people have bosses. And so if someone's just really unwilling to do what they're supposed to do, maybe we visit the next level up and try to find a, a someone with power to act upon that individual. And not in a, in a mean way, but in a way that like, we like steady, consistent pressure toward, towards the goal. One more question. Um, hi, um, I enjoyed your talk. I'm from Zambia, and um, I know the International Justice Mission is working in Zambia. Um, what I wanted to know is, um, it, it appears to me that poverty really is a big problem, and a lot of people who get into slavery voluntarily just so that they can um, survive. So. Um, I know it focuses on the justice part of it, but is there a way that you help to expand opportunities for people so they don't, and I know people actually might leave slavery and get back into it. I've heard stories of people that have left prostitution and have gone back into it, or um, street kids, and like hundred street kids an issue, it's a big issue, and these reform street kids sometimes go back to the street. So um, in what way does international justice mission with such issues? The, the, the question is, is how does poverty relate to, to, to the work um, the International Justice Mission does? There's no way to separate the fact that poverty and crime have, have a correlation. That is, individuals who are vulnerable are more often victimized, whether it's street kids, widows, whether it's individuals who um, don't have financial resources or education. All these things play a part. Those are important needs that have to be met. What is unique about issues regarding justice is that in addition to those problems, in addition to not having education or money or access to health care or access to credit or whatever the, whatever the, the troublesome um, aspect of poverty is, is being realized is that um, there is actually a criminal actor. There is, a, there is an individual who has power that is using that power to hurt others. That is, that is unique. And 
That is the piece that International Justice Mission is attempting to address. Um, it is not everyone who is involved in human trafficking or victimized by human trafficking is also in poverty. And not everybody in poverty ends up being a victim of human trafficking. And so I think it's, um, it's an important issue, but it, in terms of poverty, I mean, it's something that needs to be addressed. IJM's focus is, is that if we can stop people from being victimized, if we can stop individuals from hurting other people, then they have the opportunity to take advantage of all of the work that's being done to fight poverty, to increase education, to increase access to, um, to credit and healthcare. Uh, it's a targeted approach. Uh, and obviously, every organization can't do everything. In IJM's aftercare programs for people that are rescues, a lot of the sort of works are being done with individuals that are coming out in terms of making sure they have medical care, food, and housing, and things of that nature. Um, but I, I do want to be clear that, because I think we can get tangled up in the idea that we can't do anything about trafficking until we solve all the underlying problems and all the reasons that people are vulnerable. Um, I don't think it's the case. I think we can try to end vulnerabilities and end poverty, but we can also immediately stop people from being oppressed and hurt today. Like we can go in and act on that individual case. And if we act on individual case after individual case, we can bring change. Um, and those, those broader issues of poverty uh, are going to exist, and we have to address those as well. We have clearly had a rich evening of uh, sharing from John's heart and his experience and his vision and uh, International Justice Mission and the Department of Justice. And so we are deeply grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. And it has been our hope and prayer from the beginning that this would not only be a learning experience, but uh, something that would affect the way we think, the way we act, and again remind you of uh, opportunities for follow-up response, and also invite you to uh, uh, turn in your questionnaires to measure as you leave, and uh, we will keep you posted on further events. Thank you for coming.